Hello and good evening to this evening's edition of Scotland at Seven on Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Ruth Watson. My guest this evening is Guy Ingerson, co-convener of the Green Party in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Hi Guy, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Well, we've got an action-packed, uh, news-filled programme ahead and we're looking forward to hearing what your perspectives are on the stories of the day. But I'll just run through the headlines first and then we'll We'll come back to you and get uh, get started with the programme in the chat side of things. Um, so the Ukraine update, day 691. Ukraine has pushed ahead with its peace formula to end nearly two years of war with Russia with a meeting of national security advisers from around the world in Davos on Sunday. Andriy Yermak, the Ukrainian president's chief of staff, posted photos of the meeting's opening and hailed a good sign that the number of participants in a string of conferences on President Zelensky's peace formula was growing, nearly half from Europe, as well as 18 from Asia and 12 from Africa. Now, the Israel-Gaza latest, a total of 24,100 Palestinians have been killed and 60,834 have been injured in Israeli strikes on Gaza since the 7th of October, the Gaza Health Ministry said in a statement today. It said 132 Palestinians were killed and 252 injured in the past 24 hours. A US-owned cargo ship has been hit by a missile off the coast of Yemen. A cargo ship near Yemen has been hit by the missile, causing a fire and damage to a hold in the latest attack on Red Sea shipping. Uh, the SNP Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn, has pledged the SNP will put the fight against Westminster cuts at the centre of our election campaign, as the Labour Party admits it will continue deep austerity cuts. The International Monetary Fund has warned that there will be a significant effect of, on jobs and inequality from artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will affect 40% of jobs around the world and it is crucial that countries build social safety nets to mitigate the impact on vulnerable workers, according to the head of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. AI, the term for computer systems that can perform tasks usually associated with human levels of intelligence, is poised to profoundly change the global economy with advanced economies at greater risk of disruption. Up to 150 public swimming pools in the UK could be offered an innovative way to cut their energy bills by recycling heat from computer data processing centres after a £200 million investment by Octopus Energy into a green tech firm. The tech startup, Deep Green, has already piloted using energy from processing centres to heat swimming pools, with the concept trialled last year in Exmouth in Devon. Azerbaijan has appointed no women to its 28-member COP29 Climate Committee. The organising committee for the COP29 Global Climate Change Summit in Azerbaijan in December comprises of 28 men and no women, the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, has announced. Health Secretary Michael Matheson has met frontline accident and emergency staff at the Royal Alexandria Hospital in Paisley today to see firsthand how services are coping with peak winter demand as winter pressures build on health and social care in Scotland. And uh, Iowa Republicans will brave brutally cold temperatures this evening to participate in the state's presidential caucuses as Donald Trump remains a clear frontrunner in the race for his party's non nomination. The University of Glasgow has planted 20,000 trees across 11 hectares at Cochino Farm and Research Centre in the northwest of the city as part of its ongoing efforts to be a leading institution in sustainability. So coming back to the Ukraine uh, story, um, the day 691 of the, the Russian war in Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky travelled to Switzerland today as Ukraine tries to ensure stable support from allies as the war against Russia nears its second anniversary. President Zelensky is due to meet the heads of both Houses of Parliament, party leaders and the President of Switzerland, uh, participate in the World Economic Forum in Davos, said a statement from the presidency on Sunday. 
China needs to be involved in efforts to end the war between Ukraine and Russia, Switzerland's co-chair of the Davos meeting, Ignacio Cassi, told a news conference after a session. France and Germany reaffirmed their support for Ukraine for as long as is needed in its war with Russia. We are in full agreement that we must support the Ukrainians for as long as necessary, French Foreign Minister Stéphane Sejourné told journalists in Berlin, alongside German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. Baerbock said they would remain on the side of Ukraine as long as necessary until Russia has withdrawn from Ukrainian territory. On Sunday, Russian billionaire Oleg Deripaska said there was unlikely to be peace in Ukraine until at least May 2025, and constructive discussion at Davos and ending the conflict would not be possible because no Russian delegate would or delegation would attend. North Korean Foreign Minister Chloe Sonhui will visit Russia from Monday to Wednesday at the invitation of her counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, the North's KCNA news agency said. Ukrainians are being urged to create drones for the military at home as part of the People's Drone Project. Participants can take a free engineering course to teach themselves how to assemble a 7-inch FPV, first-person view, drone at home. Denmark will allocate a new $21 million aid package to Ukraine for the restoration of the southern Ukrainian city of Mykolaiv. The assistance package, along among other things, includes projects for demining agricultural land and reconstructing the dormitory of the Mykolaiv State Agrarian University. In its latest Defence Intelligence update, the UK Ministry of Defence said the impact of the war with Ukraine on healthcare in Russia was highly likely being felt by Russia's civilian population as they struggled to access hospital services and experience shortages of medical products due to the treatment of wounded personnel. I mean, Guy, it's, it's here we are again. I mean, the, the, the Ukraine, it is a remarkable story. It's this much smaller country sort of resist the assembled might of the Russian Federation. Um, and yet they, they keep on hanging in there. How, what's your take on the current situation and, and, and how significant is it, do you think, that they are at Davos speaking to world leaders at a time when perhaps, you know, so the American backing seems to be perhaps a little more shaky? I think there's there's two parts to this. There's the the moral case for uh, defending Ukraine. You know they didn't start this war. This was a war of aggression by the Russian Federation. Um, and I think in that moral argument, we need to be standing full square behind uh, the people of Ukraine um, and their government, um, their duly elected government, in making sure that they can resist this aggression. Uh, you know, as effectively as possible. I think it's sad to see, um, you know, this summer's offensive not be as successful as they had planned. That's not to say they didn't make gains, um, but those gains were a huge loss of life. Uh, we don't know the exact figures, but we do know um, that the Ukrainian government is on a recruitment drive at the moment because of the sheer number of people that they've lost in this war. And then there's the other side of this, which is, um, our own self-interest and the self-interest of both Europe and the United States. Ukraine is a massive food producer. This war has disrupted those food supplies, which have obviously ramped up the cost of living. Um, all of us have seen the price of basic uh, foodstuffs go up, in particular wheat products, so bread, etc., pasta, things that, um, you know, the, the wheat production that's coming from Ukraine um, having been disrupted is then affecting the prices of those goods. And there's the other side of this, you know, if we allow Russia to, you know, get away with a war of aggression like this, in the same way that we allowed them to get away with their aggression towards Georgia, we've allowed them, you know, to sabre rattle towards their neighbours, we've allowed, you know, them to intervene uh, in places like Kazakhstan, where, where protests were, were threatened to overthrow the government there. If we allow them to roll the tanks into Kiev, we're risking the security of not just Ukraine, but of the rest of Europe as well. As we all know, when tyrants succeed in taking territory um, through military means, they usually don't stop there. They usually get greedy for more. So there's the self-interest side of things that we need to be aware of and why we need to continue to support Ukraine. And there's also that moral argument, which I think is, is just as strong, if not even stronger. 
well, moving to a story where the moral arguments seem to be almost flipped on their heads um, with with the sort of the Western Western take on on the reporting of it at least, uh, looking at her to Israel and Gaza. I mean, Gaza urgently needs more aid, or its desperate population will suffer widespread famine and disease. The heads of three major United Nations agencies have warned. Authorities in the territory reported that the death toll in the Israel-Hamas war had surpassed 24,000 people, most of them innocent. While the United Nations agency chiefs did not directly point a finger at Israel, they said aid delivery had been hobbled by the opening of too few border crossings, a slow vetting process for trucks and goods going into Gaza, and continued fighting throughout the territory. A new round of negotiations to obtain the release of Israeli hostages held in Gaza by Hamas has made incremental progress, sources close to the talk say, signalling the end to months of deadlock and raising hope amongst relatives as the war passes its 100th day. A fresh attack on a ship passing through the Gulf of Aden is being investigated by United Kingdom Maritime Trade Operations UK MTO. It posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, that it had re received reports of an incident 95 nautical miles southeast of Aden, Yemen. It said, Master reports portside a vessel hit from above by a missile. Authorities are investigating. Two Palestinians carried out coordinated car rammings in Ranana in central Israel today, killing a woman and injuring 12 other people, police and medical officials said as tensions soared over the conflict in the Gaza Strip. Police described the incident as a terrorist attack and said two suspects were under arrest. Israeli forces killed five combatants who were trying to locate weapons in northern Gaza and killed another two who had been loading weapons onto a vehicle in the territory south, according to the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF. Yazan al zuaida a video journalist from the Cairo-based television channel al Qad, was killed in the Gaza Strip on Sunday in a strike that the channel blamed on the Israeli army. The White House said, It is the right time for Israel to scale back its military offensive in the Gaza Strip, as Israeli leaders again vowed to press, again, press ahead with their offensive against Hamas. The comments exposed the growing differences between the close allies on the 100th day of the conflict. The U.S. cannot call for restraint while supporting Israel's war in Gaza, Hossein Amir Abdel Hayyan, is Iran's foreign minister, said today, while calling for a diplomatic solution to the war in the Strip. China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, called for a larger, more authoritative Israeli-Palestinian peace conference and a timetable to implement a two-state solution as the Gaza conflict escalated and the Red Sea became a new flashpoint. The UK has no interest in taking part in any wider conflict in Yemen, but is waiting to see what happens before deciding whether further military strikes against Houthi forces might be needed, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps had said. Hizb Tahrir will be banned from organising in the UK following claims that the group is anti-Semitic, the Home Secretary has said. Well, I mean, there's there's a huge amount to unpick in Israel uh, with, with what's happening in, with the, 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 the murders and the slaughter of, of innocent Palestinians in Gaza as Israel claims to be hunting down Hamas. Um, that, I mean... Uh, where does one begin with this guy? I mean, it's it's. I think there, there's reports saying that there's been very little coming out of Gaza. The thinking is that perhaps the Wi-Fi and everything, the telephone signals have been turned off. But but I think that um, journalists that was killed today, I think it's uh, 129 journalists that have been killed, which is more than were killed in the entire of the Second World War. I mean, what? Where do we go? Where does the world go? And 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 what can we do? Well I, well, I think the first step is just the immediate step that we need to take uh, and that the world needs to take is to be push in for a ceasefire. We've already seen a temporary ceasefire uh, agreed between Hamas and the state of Israel that was mediated through Qatar. There is no reason, in my view at least, that we could not be seeing a similar uh, ceasefire right now to deliver humanitarian aid to the people who need it, but also to ensure that the hostages Hamas are keep, keeping are released. One of uh, Israel's stated war aims is to secure the release of all the hostages. They've actually killed some of their own uh, hostages, their own people in, in this bombing campaign. And the second objective was to destroy Hamas. Well, they're objectively not doing that. 
there was a, a poll conducted in the West Bank that showed that popularity of Hamas has actually increased. And with every civilian, with every innocent family killed, Hamas is able to recruit more fighters. That is the, that are, that, those are facts, undeniable facts. So Israel is not achieving its stated war aims. Uh, obviously, there's an ongoing case um, that South Africa has filed with the International uh, Court of Justice, which is stating that essentially Israel's aims are, are genocidal and not just those that have been stated by Israel. And I think it's, it's important to, to look at the South African case and at their own history of apartheid and repression to understand where they may be coming from and their perspective. Similarly, other countries such as Namibia are supporting their case. And on the flip side, Israel is being supported by, by Germany, who I, you know, has a, has a memory of, of guilt uh, when it comes to the, the Holocaust. Uh, quite brightly so, but seems to have forgotten its its other atrocities in places like Namibia, which the government of Namibia has reminded them of. So I think the first thing is to get that ceasefire, get the humanitarian aid in, and get as many hostages released as possible. After that, we really need to see the quartet, which has been, you know, nowhere to be seen, um, actually getting the parties together and sitting around the negotiation table uh, to see if we can get a long-term peaceful settlement. And that will involve talking to people like President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, who, again, has been completely sidelined uh, throughout the flicks. So that would be the immediate steps, I would say. Uh, yes, and of course, the Palestinian Authority is no friend of Hamas. I mean, the, the, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of, I mean, Hamas doesn't really have much of a locus or a presence uh, in the West Bank. Well, as you say, sympathies for their actions, which, of course, can never justify the killing of civilians. Um, it's it's you know kidnappings and, and, and can never be justified. But as people are watching the slaughter of innocents, it's 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 hard to see how this doesn't develop into a vicious cycle. And and it, of course, as we're seeing with these sort of missile attacks by the Houthi rebels, um, this the, the 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 risk of it growing into a wider regional conflict which perhaps was part of the intention of Vladimir Putin and 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 the Iranian um, sort of leadership when they were supporting Hamas on October the 7th you know perhaps there's a quite a significant degree of of sort of deflection and 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 a wish to spark wider troubles as as both Iran and Russia have have got a number of their own issues going on but when China is that you know, China with their track record is turning around and telling Israel they've gone too far. It's 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 really pretty appalling. But I mean, so we're looking today. The MV Gibraltar Eagle, a Marshall Islands flagged U.S. owned bulk carrier, was hit by an anti-ship ballistic missile fired from a Houthi-controlled area of Yemen. The U.S. military said it said the ship reported no injuries or significant damage and was continuing its journey. The United Kingdom Maritime Trade Operations Agency said the vessel was 95 nautical miles southeast of Aden and advised vessels to transit with caution. The British maritime security company Ambry said three missiles were launched by the Houthis, but two did not reach the sea. Yemen's Iran-backed Houthis have been attacking commercial ships in the Red Sea. It says are linked to Israel or bound for Israeli ports, aiming to support Palestinians in the war in Gaza. US and UK forces responded last week by carrying out dozens of air and sea strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen and have hit scores of targets. Explosions have been reported near Hodeida Airport in Yemen today. The Houthi attacks and Western airstrikes have heightened fears that Israel's war with the Palestinian militant group Hamas could engulf the wider region. The Houthi's chief negotiator said on Monday the group's stance has not changed since the US led airstrikes on its positions and warned that attacks on ships headed to Israel would continue. In Westminster today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak defended the UK de joining the US in attacking Houthi rebel sites in Yemen. He said the action was taken in self-defence and was limited, not escalatory. Mr Sunak said it was a necessary and proportionate response to a direct threat to UK missiles and therefore to the UK itself. Sir Keir Starmer replied that Labour backed the action taken last week, calling the airstrikes proportionate. The SNP's Westminster leader Stephen Flynn asked the Prime Minister what the UK government would do if the Houthis ignore the airstrikes. Mr Flynn said the PM should be willing to say how far he is willing to go, as he warned of a risk of escalation, adding 
A ceasefire in Gaza is essential for regional stability. I mean, this last point, I think, is is absolutely key. Um, it, it seems to me that the the um, the UK and US are in bombing the Houthi rebels, and it, I mean, one could argue that, that what else are they supposed to do? But you know, they're saying that they're protecting international shipping because otherwise it's going to be, you know, there are safe shipping routes that, that vessels could take, but they say it takes so long would add to prices, would boost, you know, a turbocharge inflation. Um, so they're prepared to go and bomb another country um, for them to pass through waters that actually are neither, you know, US nor, nor UK. I mean, it could be argued that they're international. It's an international shipping route. Um, but do you... How likely is it, do you think, that this is the UK and the US falling into this sort of post-colonialist, well, we're big and, and we can do what we want sort of approach, which which actually will inflame local sentiments where countries around the entire region are saying that they don't want the UK and the US using their land, their territory or their waters to support Israel, and 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 when you're looking at some of the international news and international pundits talking, there, there's a lot of anger, saying that actually the West does not understand the feelings among local countries that this is yet again, you know, the Gazans are the wrong colour for the West to be sympathetic towards their their slaughter. So I think I think there's a number of different things that are sort of coming together all at once. Um, so you you mentioned previously Iran. Iran has been distracting uh, it, its people from the domestic issues. We had the the feminist protests. Um, we've had economic issues in Iran. We've had numerous attempts to overthrow the regime. So Iran's interests are to destabilize and to get involved in, in foreign affairs as much as possible in order to distract its, both its own population, but also to hide its own internal weaknesses. Um, then you've got the Houthis, for example. So the Yemeni civil war has been going on for quite some time, and Yemen has essentially been ignored by the international community uh, this entire time. And I suspect the Houthis have seen an opportunity to, to highlight what is going on in Yemen and to, to flex their muscles when it comes to uh, negotiations for uh, a settlement um, and, and peace in Yemen, showing that they have the, the ability to, to, inflict, to inflict damage um, or, you know, using quite, you know, not exactly sophisticated technology, you know, fairly cheap drones, for example, to, to hit tankers, whereas we're using missiles that cost thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds to shoot these drones down. So I think there's a number of different things happening all at once. And it might seem as if they're all, you know, very simply fit together, you know, and we, you know, we should take, uh, we should, we should take these actors' words with a pinch of salt and actually look at what are they actually trying to achieve with these things. Because it's not particularly in the Houthis' best interests to be attacking international shipping when they have a situation in Yemen where ships are struggling to get in to provide food to Yemen. So, you know, there's there's obviously something else going on there. And, and as uh, in regards to it's very similar to, to the, the situation in Palestine and Israel. We've ignored these festering wounds, these ongoing conflicts, um, we haven't been, the UK, the US, they are trying to establish a long-term peace. And now we're having a situation where these, you know, these conflicts are, are spilling over into to areas that will directly affect both us, uh, our domestic population and our, and our wider interests. But I mean, what, what do you, I mean, when, when, when Rishi Sunak says, well, this is a sort of proportionate response, um, I mean, there, there, there were you know, obviously many on both sides of the house that, that were in agreement with that. But do we risk being dragged yet again into a destabilizing conflict in you know, the Middle East and, and, and North Africa? I mean, the people of Libya and Iraq are still, mm. um, you know, living with the aftermath of the last interventions. Well, this is the thing. We we're we're intervening essentially, whether we we, we think we are or not. We're intervening in uh, a civil war, uh, you know, by bombing the Houthis or and you know, it's, 
it's questionable to, to to see how effective these these bomb these bombing campaigns have been when the Houthis are using small, you know, uh, quite mobile technology and can just move from an area pretty quickly. So it's it's questionable how effective this bombing campaign would be in the, in in the first case. But secondly, you know, why why are we getting involved in the Yemeni civil war through military action when we haven't been getting involved when it comes to the negotiations? You know, when it comes to a settlement that will actually stabilize Yemen. Uh, allow it to to have a you know a, a functioning government and to uh, you know hopefully allow it to prosper. We've not we've been completely missing from the field. And if we were to be getting involved militarily, where's our mandate to do that? Parliament hasn't voted for it. Parliament hasn't even sat to discuss it. Uh, and there's no mandate from any authority within Yemen seeking assistance either. So I, I think people do people who point to the the neo colonial nature of this, you know, raise an important point, and we should be. Ex- incredibly wary about getting involved in yet another internal conflict in the Middle East when you know we're still seeing the consequences both through refugee waves through um, you know inflationary pressures of our last adventures in the Middle East so I think we definitely should be cautious and we should be very wary of this development well moving to the sort of domestic sphere SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn MP has pledged the SNP will put the fight against Westminster cuts at the center of our election campaign as the Labour Party admits it will continue tor- deep Tory austerity cuts Mr Flynn says the SNP's strong opposition to Westminster austerity austerity cuts will be a clear dividing line between the SNP and the Tory Labour Westminster establishment at this election. Alongside our firm commitment to EU membership, more powers for the Scottish Parliament and a choice over Scotland's future. It comes as Rachel Reeves admitted in the Times the Labour Party would continue Tory plans to impose significant real terms cuts to public spending for years to come, having also abandoned a commitment to properly invest in renewable energy. Analysis by the IFG suggests a continuation of the real terms cuts set out in the autumn statement could mean cuts of 3.4% for unprotected departments, slashing public spending in Scotland through the Barnet consequentials. In a separate interview published in The Observer, Sir Keir Starmer said a Labour government would not redistribute wealth from the richest to the poorest. Asked by Anushka Athana whether he would tax the super rich and redistribute it to the poorest, Starmer said no. And in a BBC interview on Sunday with Laura Kunzberg, Starmer admitted the Labour Party has broken its pledge to properly invest in renewable energy. Commenting, SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn MP said, Voting SNP is the only way to make Scotland Tory free, and it's the best defence against another decade of Westminster cuts to public services and the economy. The SNP is the only party championing, championing the investment needed to protect our NHS and boost economic growth. Our strong opposition to cuts will be a clear dividing line between the SNP and the Tory Labour Westminster establishment at this election, alongside our commitment to EU membership more powers for the Scottish Parliament and a choice over Scotland's future. By copying the Tories on cuts just as they did on Brexit, Keir Starmer's Labour Party has made a catastrophic error and shown the SNP is the only party at Westminster standing up for Scotland's values and interests. SNP Westminster leader said the Commons should have been recalled. Oh, it must be for the um, Yemen story. Uh, So, I mean, Stephen... I'm supposed to... (laughs) Um, Guy the, Stephen Flynn, as he's as he's talking here, uh, I mean it. It's on the one hand you can see where he's coming from, but on the other, does it really cut through the to the voting public? You know, when you're out chatting the doors and talking to people, are they really worried about uh, you know this whole messaging about getting rid of the Tories forever? Or does that not sound a wee bit sort of undemocratic? Because surely there will be a right of centre party in an independent Scotland, and it's. It just, you know, and we will use this whole thing about, um, you know, a choice over Scotland's future. What happened to a vote for for the SNP will be a vote for independence. I mean, is it just a wee bit, sort of a bit of a mixter baxter and a bit, a bit peely wally this whole messaging? Well, you know, all of us are going to be getting involved in this game a little bit. Um, so, you know, uh, the public better buckle up. We're going to have a whole year of uh, slogan, uh, slogans. We're going to have a whole year of uh, policy announcements. We're going to have a whole year of the only party doing this is us. 
Um, and that's not always the case. Um, and I would argue that a lot of the stuff that Stephen Flynn has suggested, his party are the only ones doing, are also ones things that the Scottish Greens believe in as well. So you're going to hear a lot of this um, over the next year. It's going to be, I would suggest, quite a, a fiery general election campaign. Um, I think, you know, it's a bit like sharks in the water. We can all smell the blood coming from the Conservative Party uh, right now. And I think everyone's fighting tooth and nail to secure, you know, as many seats as possible. Or if they're, you know, less likely to win seats to, to get their message out there and and change the narrative of political debate in the UK. And I'm thinking of places, you know, political parties such as Reform uh, UK um, in particular. So yeah, we're gonna hear a lot of this. I think when it comes to Labour, God, what can I say? <laughs> Disappointment is an understatement when it comes to Keir Starmer. Um, there's not a promise he has not broken and he's not even in Downing Street yet. So I would take everything Keir Starmer and the Labour Party say with a pinch of salt. My party has been more than willing to work with Labour wherever we can. You know, we recognise that they are certainly not the Tories and, you know, they have a, a good few progressives within their ranks. But when Keir Starmer speaks, I tend to switch off. Um, and I would imagine quite a lot of the public are doing the same. When we look at polls, we can see that there is no love for Keir Starmer. There's not even that much love for the Labour Party. The reason why they're riding so high in the polls is because of the complete collapse of the Conservatives. And I don't need to tell you, Ruth, uh, why that is the case. Uh, the Conservatives have completely wrecked the economy. They've indulged in culture war rhetoric, which is, you know, caused huge harm to, to minority communities, whether it's the trans community, whether it's uh, migrants, they've been on the attack continuously and it doesn't seem to be helping them in the polls either. So if they uh, intend to do better at the next general election, I would suggest they change tack. But I mean, for, for uh, you know, sort of pro-indie supporters, is there anything to be inspired about in in the the messaging that's coming out of 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 the SNP and in the way that that Reform UK might split the Tory vote? Could it be said that the Green standing seats, putting candidates up in seats across Scotland, could split the SNP vote? Could split the pro indie vote? So I'll take the the voters side of the first. So nobody owns voters. You know, if, if, say, for example, Greens don't stand in a seat, there is absolutely no guarantee those Green voters will vote SNP. You know, that's just, you know, you can see that in local council elections. It depends on the area. So in some areas, you know, uh, you, you'll get Green voters who use uh, their second preference for the SNP, but in other areas, they'll use their second preference for Labour. And in some of the more posh, leafy uh, suburbs, they'll maybe uh, use their vote for the Lib Dems. So you can see that those voters and the voting patterns, they don't think like people like me, uh, political anoraks, you know, they don't think, oh yeah, well, I'll just go to the next progressive party. Sometimes that's not uh, the case. Maybe they'll go based on the candidate, for example. So none of us own voters. Um, and when it comes to standing candidates, the Greens are really clear that we'll be standing candidates to give people that choice for a pro-independence party that is dedicated to both social and environmental justice um, and has that at the core of our, our values and our belief system and our policy platform. Regards the oh, independence Amy. debate, sorry, sorry, two seconds straight, I'll just finish this off. When it comes to the independence debate, I do not blame independence voters for being a bit despondent, you know? Um, We've seen court cases that haven't went our way. And we have a situation where I personally think the public, when I'm chapping doors, they've moved on. Um, and for those of us who are passionate about independence, that can be, you know, that can be quite tough. But their main focus right now when I'm chapping doors is the NHS and the economy and cost of living. And that's the two things that if we are to fight any independence campaign right now, if we were to do that to today, we would have to be fighting on those issues as well and saying why independence is the best way to have a stronger economy and to, to protect our NHS. So we're definitely going to see those arguments coming up this year. Well, here's hoping because we're looking at the International Monetary Fund. Analysis says that about 60% of jobs in advanced econ economies such as the US and UK are exposed to artificial intelligence and half of these jobs may be negatively affected. But the technology will also help to advance, enhance some humans' productivity as AI improves their performance, it said. 
According to the International Monetary Fund, the safest, highly exposed jobs are those with a high complementarity uh, to AI, meaning the technology will assist their work rather than displace it entirely. This includes roles with a high degree of responsibility and interacting with people such as surgeons, lawyers and judges. High exposure jobs with low complementarity, meaning the potential for being displaced by AI, include telemarketing or cold calling people to offer goods or services. Low exposure occupations include dishwashers and performers, the IMF said. AI job exposure is 40% in emerging market economies, defined by the IMF as states including China, Brazil and India and 26% for low-income countries with an average total, an overall total, of just under 40%, according to the IMF. Generative AI, the term for technology that can produce highly plausible text, images, and even voice from simple hand-typed prompts, has risen up the political agenda since the emergence of tools such as the ChatGBT chatbot. Kristalina Georgievia, the IMF Managing Director, said, AI's ability to affect highly skilled jobs means that advanced economies face greater risks from the technology. She added that in extreme cases, some jobs in major economies could disappear. She added that in most scenarios, AI would probably worsen overall inequality across the global economy and could stoke social tensions without political intervention. AI is expected to feature prominently as a topic of discussion at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week, with top executives from the tech industry will which which top executives from the tech industry will attend. The IMF analysis shows that higher wage earners whose jobs have high complementarity with AI can expect an increase in their income, leading to an increase in inequality. I mean, Guy, it, it's, there's so much to unpick there. We won't sort of drill down into too much of it. Uh, it. Obviously, billionaires are always going to want somebody to come and clean their kludgy and serve them tea. But, uh, I mean, we're looking at Oxfam today saying that the world's first trillionaire could be on the horizon soon and people like Jeff Bezos and, and, and you know Bill Gates, uh, you know, and, and Elon Musk and that actually, you know, billionaires are really bad for the economy because they don't trickle down their money, they just hoard it like they don't have enough. So I mean what's your take from the green perspective on on the the, the rise of AI and what it might do to displaced People, we already saw what happened when the fishing industry and when coal went. You know, what's that going to mean yeah. to people? People's lives didn't get better because the social, you know, the sort of uh, sort of the social system didn't rise up to meet them. It just abandoned them. Well, this this is about fundamentally the structure of economy. So, you know, Greens uh, are massive advocates of the steady state economy. The economy should serve people. People should not serve the economy, uh, and that's the kind of argument we'd be making. God decades now, you know, um, and it's finally uh, starting to slowly but surely seep into public consciousness. You know, there are other ways to do capitalism if you're going to do it. So uh, I would, you know, urge viewers to check out the Mondragon Corporation in the Basque Country, an example of a worker owned, uh, you know, cooperative, where they get to vote on the salary of their their managers, and they have a rough, uh, you know, lowest paid employee to highest paid employee, the ratio is roughly five to one. Um, whereas in your standard FTSE 100 companies, I think it's 50 to 1. So you can see the huge inequalities that we have in, in most companies and most uh, corporations. And then you can see a model there that is highly successful, such as the Mondragon Corporation, which is actually creating equality between both bosses uh, and, and workers as well. So, you know, it's, it's not so much about the AI. It's about what we choose to use the AI for. And right now, because of the structure of our economy is about maximizing profit motive and, you know, ensuring that trillionaires and billionaires uh, be or billionaires become trillionaires, should I say, uh, that is fun fundamentally the problem. If we had a more equal economy and we moved to uh, a more steady state economy, then the use of AI could be more more revolutionary, more beneficial to individuals and actually give people more leisure time, you know. so. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is because our economy is set up the way it is, AI is actually more likely to disrupt our economy and create more inequality. So it's not so much about the AI as a brilliant technology. It's about the system that we have at the moment. Although, I mean, from a, as a journalist, I would like to see there being some sort of... Um, uh, sort of rule as as we see sort of for, for 
photographs sort of that, that have been altered, that there has to be like a sort of code we code saying that this has been digitally altered because it would be good it would be good if we could have some sort of a uh, labeling system which meant that people could actually tell what was being ai generated and what was actually being created by a person so, because the, the sort of deep fake is a real issue especially with the sort of political campaigning isn't it yeah and, and and that's going to be an issue uh you know we already see you know the rise of social media influencers sometimes you can't tell if the product they're talking about is an ad that they've been paid to to promote or if it's something um you know that they just happen to really like and you know we have toothless tiger regulatory bodies like the asa which is supposed to uh, you know regulate these these advertisements make sure you have hashtag ad or that you're actually saying you know this is a a, a paid partnership um, and we're not even enforcing those. So it's really difficult to see how we've been enforcing right now with, with the way things stand, the, the kind of uh, thing that you're talking about. And we really need to up our game and get, get people in power who are actually going to look at this and take it more seriously than they are so far. I mean, one of the other things is, you know, we're, we're all being told that, you know, to stop printing paper and, you know, sort of to, to do everything online. But I mean, the, the energy that these, 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 um, you know, sort of the the energy. I would imagine that my stash of of photographs I'm never going to look at and again and documents and emails. You know, I mean that sort of is churning away its own little sort of rocket fuel launchers, isn't it? I mean, and here we've yeah. got up to 150 public swimming pools in the UK could be offered an innovative way to cut their energy bills by recycling heat from computer data processing centres after a £200 million investment by Octopus Energy into a green tech firm. The tech startup Deep Green has already piloted using energy from processing centres to heat swimming pools with a concept trialled last year in Exmouth, Devon. The new investment announced today is likely to result in the energy ex solution expanded to leisure centres across the country over the next two years. Mark Bjornsgaard, the chief executive of Deep Green, said the idea could go well beyond providing energy for swimming pools if just 1% of the data centre demand in the UK operated on our servers. We could deploy in every public pool in the country. The backing from Octopus is the first step, he said. Processing data generates a lot of wasted heat, which Deep Green's scheme aims to repurpose to provide free heat energy for energy intensive organisations such as leisure centres, which have been affected by soaring bills and the cost of living crisis, with many having to close or cut hours. I mean, this is absolutely it's a fascinating idea and, and one could almost say it's no wonder that it was a Nordic that came up with it. Uh, but, but you know, is this, can you, I mean, it's this is mad dichotomy that on the one hand, we're you know, pumping all this heat into, into, into data, you know, sort of like st storing our bank statements online and, and all this actually pretty important stuff that maybe we should be printing out. But, but, you know, that would be enough to heat local resources and on the other side we've got this cost of living crisis and people are freezing in their homes during the winter because they can't afford to heat because the energy companies are making an absolute killing so i mean surely this is an indication that we've got things just crazy wrong well so i'd need to look into this particular uh scheme that octopus is running um because one of the things that came up from uh, a story i read in iceland was you know who have huge amounts of these uh, data processing centers um, they were taking huge amounts of power from the grid uh you know geothermal power in particular so i would i would be slightly cautious about this i'd like to get a bit more information I think it's a good idea to, you know, recycle the heat. Obviously, I'm in favor of that. But if uh, if it's a false economy where you're taking more from the grid and you're taking more energy, um, basically from the grid that could be going to homes instead, and then you're putting it into processing centers and then recycling the heat back to pools, you might have actually a, a loop there that's actually not as efficient or using the resources as effectively as it could be. So something I'm definitely going to look into. But yeah, you're right. More widely. People freezing in their homes right now, food banks, you know, on the rise, you know, it's all quite depressing at the moment. You know, I was speaking to uh, someone on the doorstep in Newton Hill uh, just this weekend on Saturday who said that the cost of their energy bills were so high, plus the rent that they were uh, facing at the moment, that they were just thinking to themselves, you know, they'd had a, a kid who was living with them, now an adult, who was paying digs that was helping, you know, support the family household, but they're looking to move now because the costs of everything are, are so high 
that they're not entirely sure if they can still live in the the home that they raise their kids in. So, you know, it's really quite depressing at the moment. Um, but if there are ways that we can recycle heat, uh, heat, uh, you know, local uh, heat district, you know, district heating networks, should I say, are a really good example of where we could be doing that, then we should be doing that. And uh, it's just a case of getting the money uh, in order to, to actually implement these policies. And we've already seen, here's my little partisan bit, Ruth, uh, with Scottish Greens in government, we are actually, you know, starting to tackle the issue of uh, zero carbon bill uh, buildings and, and looking at uh, district heat networks and heat pumps. So, you know, it's depressing at the moment, but there is some progress. I mean, it certainly works very well in Shetland, doesn't it? The 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 district yep. heating, and um, so uh, and of course our neighbours across the water seem to manage. But I guess it's a different political will, which um, I'm sure that uh, that that yourself and the, those others in the Butte House Agreement would be saying that uh, an independent Scotland would be able to do all these things differently. But I mean, exactly. looking at that looking looking at issues to do with climate and um, the organizing committee for the cop 29 global climate change summit in azerbaijan in december can prizes 28 men and no women the president of azerbaijan has announced the decision was called regressive by the she changes climate campaign group which said climate change affects the whole world not half of it in contrast, 63% of the members of the organising committee for the COP28 climate summit held in the United Arab Emirates last month, pardon me, were women. Almost all members of the COP29 committee are government ministers or officials, including the head of the state security service. The head of Azerbaijan's state gas distribution network is also on the committee. In a statement, She Changes Climate says, this is a regressive step in the journey towards gender parity in the climate, but there is still time for change. We must for equal representation in the governance of this year's climate talks because climate change affects the whole world, not half of it. The COP29 president-designate, who will be responsible for bringing together countries to drive climate action, is Mukhtar Babayev, the Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources. Uh, Babayev previously spent 26 years working for the state oil company of the Azerbaijan Republic, uh, Sokar. Azerbaijan plans to increase its fossil fuel production by a third over the next decade, the, Gu the Guardian revealed last week. Scientists say a rapid fall in fuel, fossil fuel burning is vital to avoid the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And 2023 was the hottest year in record by a huge margin. Well, I mean, I was listening to um, a report from Davos earlier on, and it was saying that last year was the hottest year on record, and this year looks likely to smash those records. And there's a, a, a muckle ice shelf off Canada that looks a way to collapse. And if it does, it's going to raise the, the it, it could raise the, uh, the sea levels by, by 10 feet. Um, around the world, obviously. So, I mean, we're we're looking at we're looking at we're in the middle of a polar a wobbly. It's called a wobbly polar vortex. That's that's, that's throwing out coldest of a record cold we've seen in Finland. We're seeing dangerous temperatures across um, Canada and 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 the northern states of, of of the USA. We're seeing flooding across the world and, and the, the the central bank in, in one of the was it brazil any anyway, one of the central banks was flooded you know we're watching people's homes being washed away in portland uh, record forest fires happening across australia um i mean obviously it matters that there are no women on the azerbaijani um climate change conference i mean it sort of just seems that there's it almost typifies the story, almost typifies so much of what's going wrong. You know, it's yet again a load of blokes, one of them who's been in the pocket of the oil industry, the world's on fire. I mean, what what do you think COP28 or COP29 is going to hold? It's It's a bit dire, isn't it? Yeah, so there's nothing progressive about the regime in Azerbaijan. You know, it's been a dictatorship for quite some time. I'm not at all surprised by this. You know, what was more shocking to me that was that Azerbaijan was was acting as host. You know, I would have hoped that the international community would have learned from the failures of Qatar. I mean, it wasn't a complete disaster, but I, I would have hoped we would have made more progress. You know, the whole point of COP is to abolish COP. You know, we shouldn't have to have COP29 uh, to be actually, you know, I've, I've actually managed to get to the stage where we've got a loss in damage.
damage fund. Uh, you know, COP28 was uh, when we got the, you know, actual funding for the uh, loss and damage fund. COP26 was when, this, that, you know, the, the actual fund was, was set up. So that's taken two years and there's still hardly any money in it. You know, that's a ridiculous situation. Um, and I think with, when it comes to Azerbaijan, you know, it, it, it's really quite frustrating. You know, we, we already know that women bear the brunt of climate impacts, particularly in the global south. You know, they tend to be the, the ones who are, if not farming, they're keeping the house, they're making sure they're looking after the kids, you know, quite traditional gender roles that, you know, that we'll be aware of. And as a result of that, they tend to be more likely to have, you know, those impacts because they're, they maybe don't have an income themselves. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot to unpack. But there's also the situation with food production. You know, we were all talking about the cost of living uh, throughout this this uh, this news uh, section, and and one of the biggest cost of living uh, problems we're going to have is food prices, and a lot of that is based on the climate crisis. Let's just take you mentioned flooding Pakistan. There were some devastating floods there. I think it was either last year or the year before. I can't quite remember. Hundreds of thousands of livestock killed. Uh, you know, whether it was from drowning or whether it was from uh, waterborne diseases or, you know, not being able to access pastures. So food production was massively hit. That then has an impact on, on food prices. So, you know, it's not just the, the war in Ukraine, which is going to have an impact, but we're also seeing crop failures in many parts of the world as well. It's quite, this is the bit that gets me a little bit heated up because I, I feel like the pace of change is so slow um, and we really need to be ramping that up. Um, and one of the things that's really frustrating in the UK is every time we are, are ramping those things up, particularly in Scotland, we see blocks uh, come our way. We see individuals fighting a tooth and nail for, you know, against any tiny little measure we have on climate and the environment. So we really need to change and, and wake up. I mean, it's, it's even affecting, you know, the, the the presidential election primary. You know, you've got, got uh, Trump um, going to Iowa tonight for the for the for the caucuses there. You know, DeSantis is is f collapsing towards the back. Uh, Haley, um, Nikki Haley is 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 seems to be doing quite well, but it does look like Trump's just going to romp home. And goodness knows what the man would have to do to to not be popular, but. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's the the results could be acutely impacted by the weather as a blizzard swept through, and and obviously Trump's demographic tends to be, while passionate, um, pretty geriatric, and may not be able to make it out because if you're out for more than several minutes, you start getting frostbite and blisters on your face, for example. I mean, this it's as I was reading somewhere earlier today that was saying that one of the big issues, um, one of the reasons that we're seeing, um. Uh, uh, like insurance prices going up is because of all this sort of these global catastrophes from f flooding to fires, um, you know, and, and the sort of the global insurance network could be about to collapse. And if that happens, then basically the economy collapse. So we you know all these stories that we're talking about in terms of in terms of well being and AI and jobs. Uh, it sort of almost comes down to you know Ukraine as, as you've touched on so the lack of of, of food security mm -hmm. that we have and and I mean actually it sort of strikes me that we you know sort of need to be looking a bit more at the basics rather than I mean you know, from, from the green perspective do you you know are you one for a sort of complete global reset on on economical structures because because the climate emergency well, may demand that of us. Yes, I mean, I, ideally, we, you know, we, like I said, we would be moving faster to creating the kind of economic uh, and social conditions to not only tackle this crisis, but to, to improve, improve living standards. So, you know, like I've mentioned, steady state economy, I would, you know, ask your viewers to have a wee bit of a read tonight, maybe go down a, a Wikipedia black hole um, <laughs> and have a have a look at that. I, I think, you know, Greens are big advocates of, of changing not only you know uh, how we deal with the environment, but how we deal with uh, the economic conditions which are which are affecting our environment and which then loop back uh, to to affect the economy. So yeah, that that is definitely something you'll be seeing more of us. Uh, you know, you'll be seeing us when we're looking at our Westminster manifesto, talking more about those issues and how we can actually create change at Westminster. Because for now, Scotland is locked into this system. Um, so we're going to have to try and make the best out of it that we can possibly do. But yeah, it there is, I will just say this, although it can be quite depressing, you know, as someone who's involved in climate activism, and as you know, Ruth, I've been involved in lots of local environmental campaigns as well. And often it feels like you're walking through treacle to get anything done. But there are glimpses of 
support. There are companies that are taking more action. There are individuals who are taking more action. And I think there's growing public demand and public awareness of how interconnected all of these things are. So we need a, a holistic approach. Um, and if the rest of the world isn't doing it, if we get another Trump term uh, and we have to deal with that, we're going to have to lead the way, Le leave him behind. And if America wants to stay stuck in the past, then fine. We can turbocharge our economy and make sure that we're leading the way when it comes to new technologies and a, and a new system of, of economic governance. So scary times, but there is hope out there. And I, I, and I urge people to, to keep some faith and, and to really look out for those little green shoots of, of hope that are, that are out there. Well, the University of Glasgow has planted 20,000 of those little green shoot, shoots of hope as they've planted 20,000 trees across 11 hectares at Cochinal Farm and Research Centre in the northwest of the city as part of its ongoing efforts to be a leading institution in sustainability. Among the 20,000 trees planted are various native species, including Scotch pine, silver birch, downy birch, rowan, English oak, sessile oak, hawthorn, black ord, alder and goat willow. Um, uh, Dr. David Duncan, University Secretary and Chief Operating Officer, said Cochino Farm, Cochino Farm is a university's centre for veterinary teaching and research and is increasingly vital for our work on environmental sustainability. Um, the university also seeks to provide tangible evidence to staff and students as well as the local community who use this area regularly that we are really engaged and acting towards a climate emergency on a local level. I mean, this is... You know, University of Glasgow is, is demonstrating its role as a world-changing university with pro projects focused on sustainability. Cochino Farm and Research Centre delivers core teaching and research activities for the School of Biodiversity, One Health and Veterinary Medicine at the College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Scientists, Sciences and consists of approximately 850 acres of farmland entirely owned by the university located north of Clyde Bank. I mean, I would imagine that this is the kind of thing that would have your little green heart beating with joy. Guy. Oh, very happy. Very happy indeed. What makes me more happy is learning that they're planting a variety of tree species. You know, one of the things that we often see with tree planting, which is very frustrating, is monocultures, you know, where it's all one species of tree and there's just rows and rows of them. And it's essentially a tree plantation and that does nothing for biodiversity. Yes, it will draw carbon down, but nine times out of ten it then gets chopped down. So you're not even talking about mature forests so yeah no this is really heartwarming this is a really good story i would love to see more of it um i know aberdeen city council have pledged as part of the partnership agreement uh, within their administration to plant more trees within the city so it's not just rural areas you know when we're looking at rewilding um you know we're also looking at urban areas as well and that doesn't necessarily mean an introduce wolves into morningside although that might be an attractive idea for some <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not sure that they would ever go for links there, but I'm sure there's more than one or two cookers I've passed on a Friday night. Um, but uh, I mean, in in terms of in terms of universities taking these mm. kinds of steps to, especially in an urban area or sort of semi-urban area, so that, that that people perhaps start to understand, especially if they start putting things like you know, sort of cattle and sheep grazing under trees. I mean, is this more more of what we need to be seeing in Scottish agriculture? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you, you want to see, uh, you know, we've seen a rise in community uh, food growing groups within urban areas. You know, it's really good to see wildlife. I think during the pandemic, when people were out and about walking and away from their screens, they could actually see the wildlife that they'd been missing all this time, you know, especially when, you know, we're all going to work or at home or you've got the kids, etc. So yeah, it was good. I mean, I, there's something that comes out of Edinburgh every so often pictures of uh, the otter in the the water of Leith every now and then and that really warms the warms the cockles of the soul a little bit we need to be seeing more of that yeah and it can be something as simple as you know people planting more wildflowers in their garden not cutting their grass as often that can have a huge impact on on biodiversity so yeah if we can all get stuck in that would be amazing Oh, well, positive way to end the show. Um, that's it for this evening. Uh, before I go, I just want to remind you that at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of our supporters. So to everyone who has donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment, thank you very much. Again, thank you to everyone who has donated to Broadcasting Scotland's emergency crowdfunder over the last two weeks. We are now 
only, it's not quite as scary as it was, but it's still a wee bit to go, uh, 2,500 short of our target. But we're very hopeful we will reach £10,000 by the end of today or very soon. So if you could be part of that, that would be brilliant. Stick a fiver in, we'd be very grateful for it. Even a pound, 20p, go for it. We'll take whatever you can give. Uh, the immediate pressure has been eased and we can now focus on securing the future of independent broadcasting for Scotland, although the next crowdfunder for next year is coming up hard on the heels because the cost of living crisis is biting hard. My guest this evening has been the lovely Guy Ankerson. Thank you very much for joining us, Guy. My name's Ruth thank Watson. You. Good night and thank you for watching. Thank you.